So for example, in my location, it says that this monkey flower, this is not my location because we don't have this here, um, but it says monkey flower is native and may attract these species. It's absolutely a brilliant, easy, easy tool to use. And then let's start with the showstoppers first. Um, these guys will be arriving very soon, early May. I cannot wait for them to arrive. The Baltimore Orioles, they're such beautiful songsters and just beautiful birds. And you can get these guys um, almost anywhere. I live um, on Baker's Pond in the woods. I'm on the second floor um, and um, there is some open area, but for the most part, it's wooded. And I get a ton of Orioles on my deck in the woods on the second floor. And what they're attracted to is they absolutely love, and I'm sure you guys know this, they love the grape jelly. They have an obsession with it. Um, they also will eat uh, chopped suet. I actually, um, I chop up my suet and mix it with hulled sunflower seed. And a lot of the birds, a lot of the birds love the hulled seed and a lot of the birds love the chopped suet. And these guys love the chopped pieces of suet. Um, so insects and nectar are their natural diet. And so also if you put out dried or live mealworms, that is very attractive to them. They will be arriving soon. Um, and another cool thing about them is, you know, those terrible gypsy moth caterpillars that we have some years um, in more abundance than other, others. Um, well, most birds don't eat gypsy moth caterpillars. They are very spiny and noxious. Um, these guys actually specialize on gypsy moth caterpillars because what they do is they wipe off all the spines and then consume the caterpillar. So another great reason, not only are they beautiful, but they're actually really beneficial in your backyard for eating these terrible, terrible pests. Um, the type of feeders to attract them, you know, they're not the kind of bird that's gonna hang off of a suet cage. So the chopped suet I provided in um, a hanging bowl. They'll also eat from platform feeders. They eat out of my window feeders. I have one of those small um, plastic suction cup feeder on my window and they are in it when they come back. There's also all sorts of um, particular jelly feeders and orange slice feeders. These guys love orange slices. I feel like it's very easy to attract them. And when you have them, you almost always have cat birds as well because cat birds eat very similar things. Um, I find that my Orioles also will drink out of my hummingbird nectar feeders. So you wanna make sure your nectar feeders are clean with fresh nectar always um, because these guys might be drinking out of it also. Enjoy their song because when the female starts nesting, the male stops singing. And I'm sure you all notice this, you hear that beautiful, beautiful song. And then all of a sudden, you know, by the end of May or uh, June, it stops. And that's because the male doesn't want to draw attention to the nest. So relish in the beautiful song um, that we hear in early spring and summer, because you won't hear it for long, but they're still around. Okay, so cedar waxwings. This is a beautiful bird that everyone wants in their backyard, but they're really not a back, backyard bird feeder bird. They don't come to bird feeders. Um, the best way to attract them, honestly, to a bird type feeder um, is a platform feeder in the winter. You might be able to entice them to a platform feeder by offering berries, either fresh or um, you know, frozen thawed berries, mealworms, live or dead. Um, but what they're really attracted to is fruit. Um, these guys in the summer, they eat a ton of insects. In the fall, they switch to all the fruit that is ripening and they feed their young a, a lot of fruit in the diet. And so a way to attract them to your backyard is by planting a variety of fruiting plants and plants that will fruit throughout the year so that it provides um, not only food throughout the, year, throughout the year, but also nesting spots and cover uh, for birds at different times. 
So these birds, they love uh, juniper, dogwood, serviceberry, and wild cherries. The fruits from those trees in particular are a favorite. They also will eat uh, flower petals and sap from these uh, trees and trees in these families. They are a um, year-round resident and a winter nomad. And so um, you could possibly have them nesting in your backyard, but I feel like we don't as commonly see that uh, on Cape. I know that they do nest here. Um, we do get babies uh, and it's usually towards the end of the season, um, but just not in the numbers that we would see of say a house finch um, or birds that are more common in our backyard. So the best way to get these guys, um, fruiting plants that fruit year round, um, and then a heated bird bath in the winter. They also enjoy that. They're so, so beautiful. The Northern Cardinal. Oh my goodness, this is probably the most beloved backyard bird in the United States. Uh, cardinals are abundant. They're abundant throughout the United States, in fact. Um, and they are a relative of the buntings and the grosbeaks. And they're found anywhere that you have dense shrubs. And so what they avoid is big, open, clear cut areas, but pre pretty much you can find them everywhere else. I live in the woods again, and I have cardinals uh, coming to my feeders all the time. These guys love the sunflower seed and the safflower. They are hooked. And so they will eat from tube feeders, platform feeders, um, they actually eat out of my window feeders. I said I have a, suc a suction cup feeder on my window. Uh, they're a little bit shy to do that. Um, they prefer to eat from, I have bowls out where I put um, sunflower and suet and they eat from that. So platform tube feeders, they'll pretty much eat from any kind of um, standard bird feeder. And so what attracts them is the, the sunflower and the safflower. And in the wild, they eat a ton of seeds, insects, and berries, but mostly vegetable matter. In the summer when they're feeding young, that's when they switch to more insect matter. Um, and the reason they're so abundant, it's believed is because of bird feeders. Uh, so many people feed birds that they were able to actually expand their range and survive winters with this additional food source. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. The house finch, this is such a lovely little bird. Um, this is one bird that I don't typically see here at my home. They just don't stop by. And I don't know if it's because it's too wooded um, or if it's because my other birds are bullies, but I absolutely love them. A cheerful little bird, gregarious and social. They are abundant. They are found everywhere in the United States. And something that you might find fascinating is that they are not a native bird to this area. Um, they are native to Southern California. Um, and what happened was, I can't remember the timing, but I wanna say it was late 18th century, early 19th century. Um, people were keeping these little birds as pets because they're so lovely, they're so pretty and they have a beautiful song. They were being sold in Southern California um, as Hollywood finches or redheaded linnets. Um, and the story goes that birds were brought here to New York and sold in pet stores. And there was a, a bust, a confiscation. Birds were released in huge numbers. And apparently they were, not only did they survive, but they thrived um, because of bird feeders. So bird feeders enabled them to survive winters um, and also to expand their range. And now they're found throughout the US. Over 1.4 billion individuals of house finches in the US. They're not an aggressive bird though. And so they don't get the hate mail that the other non-native species do like house finches and European starlings. Um, they like cardinals av avoid unbroken forest and grassland but you can find them pretty much everywhere else. What they're hooked on is the thistle. They love thistle or any of the finch seed mixes um, that have the smaller seeds. 
They'll also eat sunflower. Um, their diet in the wild consists of weed seeds primarily and some insect matter. And so um, they like to feed on the ground. They'll feed from thistle feeders, platform feeders, hanging dishes, um, pretty much any um, bird feeder. But the thistle feeders work well for the, them because they have the tiny little holes that are perfectly sized for their beaks and they can pull the thistle out. Oops. And I have to tell you that this is typically the first phone call of the season for baby birds that wild care gets because these guys love to nest in hanging wreaths on your front door. Uh, they also love to nest in potted plants and under boat shrink wrap. So those of you who follow Wild Care's Facebook page, you've seen I've done a lot of um, public education and outreach as well as Rebecca um, talking, telling people, you know, start checking your boat shrink wrap now and discourage birds from nesting before they actually set up a nest. Um, so if you do have these guys nesting in your hanging plants, that is, I think it's awesome. The babies fledge by 14 days. So they'll only be in your plant for a couple of weeks. And you can put ice, cube, ice cubes on the plant on the opposite side of where the nest is. Um, you can still water the plant also. You just don't want to water it so much that the water is pooling because you don't want the eggs sitting in water. If the eggs get a little, excuse me, get a little moist, that's okay, uh, but they can't be pooling in water. So the ice cube method also works. Put the ice cubes opposite the nest in the plant and then they'll just dissolve and they won't wet the nest. Um, this is, um, this is really cool actually. Those of you who follow all the birding sites, um, birding news, you probably know that we had a really, really big year for various types of finches. There were pine siskins everywhere, there were crossbills, there were evening gross beaks, pine gross beaks. Um, these are not birds that you would see in huge numbers every year. Um, these are birds that typically are further north in the winter um, and in the summer, they breed further north. Um, and in the winter, when food sources are sparse, they move south basically seeking food sources. And so this year was a huge year for us with pine siskins. There were pine siskins reported everywhere. And this is because spruce cone crops um, were poor in the north. And so we refer to these birds as eruptive and nomadic, meaning there was a ton of pine siskins this year, but next year there might only be a few because food sources will be abundant further north. It's very cool. It's too early to predict what the finch forecast is going to be for next winter. But if you look up finchnetwork.org this fall, it will tell you what we can expect for a finch year for next year. It's pretty cool. I just wanted to share that with you. Um, so here's another lovely, lovely uh, bird, another bird in the finch family. This is the American goldfinch. And their song sounds like potato chip, potato chip, potato chip. And they have this sort of undulating flight and they say potato chip, potato chip. Beautiful bird, gregarious. Um, they are not aggressive. Everyone loves them. They're widespread and common, but they prefer patches, roadsides um, where we consider sort of wasteland areas with lots of weeds is what they love, open woods and edges. Um, and so these guys are highly dependent on seeds. And we always recommend at the end of the summer when your garden is toast, we recommend that you just leave it and let everything go to seed uh, because it's birds like the American goldfinch and some of the sparrows who really, really enjoy that. And for some of the migratory um, birds that are passing through like the chipping sparrows, it will really benefit them during their migration. Uh, the American goldfinches that we have here are largely non-migratory. They might make some small movements, 
um, but pretty much the ones you see here, you will see here all year. They are the last breeding birds of the season. And for us at Wild Care, when we get over 500 baby birds in a season, we are so thrilled to see the baby goldfinches because they signify that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the goldfinches nest late because their nesting period directly coincides with the production of thistle. If you all have seen thistle plants, thistle has um, beautiful seeds, but also very downy plant fibers. And so these little birds, they use those fibers to line their nest and thistle is a staple food that is regurgitated for the young. So last of the season, you know, it's usually it's August um, and then we start getting baby squirrels in for the second litter, but the baby birds are starting to die down. Lovely, sweet, sweet little birds. I get them here in the woods um, and they will eat from platform feeders, thistle feeders, honestly, any of your standard feeders. They eat out of my window feeder and they are not picky. But what I do find is being a small, um, kind bird, uh, they do get bossed around by larger bully birds. So you have to consider that. It's nice to actually be able to set up a thistle feeder for birds like house finches and um, goldfinches. So they're not out competed by larger and more aggressive birds. So the black capped chickadee, another favorite and um, Massachusetts state bird. And also it's the state bird for, I can't remember, but like, I wanna say over 10 different states, everyone seems to love this little bird. And so they're super smart, excuse me, highly gregarious. They alert um, other chickadees and other animals to predators. You all know that chickadees, they say dee 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 dee, dee 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 dee. Well, pretty much the more dee dee dees you hear, if they, you know, if they're really like dee 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 dee, that means there's a great threat in the area. And so they're talking to other chickadees, but smart birds like blue jays and cardinals, they pick up on this and they recognize that there's a threat. It's really, really fascinating. Um, they are also master cachers. They actually store food, um, they cache it away. So in the winter months or periods of harsh weather, they have a food supply available to them. They're also notorious for doing things like this, landing on dogs or people's heads and pulling out their hair to use to line their nest. This is real, <laughs> bold little birds. Um, they absolutely adore sunflower, peanuts, and they will eat suet. They don't typically hang on a suet feeder, but they will eat chopped suet from a platform or a bowl. They eat out of my window feeder. They love hulled or shelled sunflower, and they will eat peanuts, not whole, not whole peanuts. They're too small. Um, but primarily, you know, pieces of peanuts, peanut halves. They nest in cavities, and this is a bird that can greatly benefit from you putting up a nest box. Um, there is a lot of competition for cavities, natural cavities in dead trees and snags. And a lot of times the non-native species get there first. So setting up a nest box for these guys can really, really benefit them. And I have to recommend another site, um, it's Cornell. If you go to Nest Watch, all about birdhouses, again, you can type in uh, your zip code and it will tell you the species you can attract in your neighborhood. And, um, and then it gives you instructions of how to build the box or where to buy it and where to put it. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, especially because it will tell you, you know, like if you want, I don't know, you live in Dennis and you want toucans. Well, you're going to put in your zip code and it's going to be like, oh, I'm sorry. You can maybe have great crested flycatchers, but you can't have toucans in Dennis. So it's really, really good. It narrows it down by your location. 
Oh yes, here's another one. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Here's the Nest Watch. All about bird houses. Right bird, right house. So select your region, select your habitat, and see the results. Um, and then it will give you basically instructions of how high a nest box needs to be, um, all the dimensions, and then you can either build one or buy one. It's such a great resource. So the tufted titmouse related to the chickadee, here's another bold, wonderful backyard bird that everyone loves. Um, their call is a Peter, 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 Peter. You guys know that sound, right? Peter, Peter, Peter. Um, very, very loud for such a tiny little bird. These guys are abundant throughout Cape Cod. They love a mixed woodland. So, um, you know, deciduous trees. They like tall trees um, to nest in. They adore sunflower and suet and insects. And they will pretty much eat from any of the feeders. Again, platform feeders, um, the window feeders, the, the tube feeders. They're not picky. They're rather bold, so they're not afraid to get in there with the bigger birds. They also cache food. Um, and pairs will remain together all year, but flocks form in the fall and winter because there's safety in numbers. This is another species that can benefit from having you put up a nest box. Typically they like their nests high, you know, 35 feet or more above the ground. Um, and important to point out these little birds, they cannot excavate on their own. They don't have the tools to dig out or peck out their own nest. Um, so that's why with a lack of available natural cavities in dead trees and in snags, we can really help them by putting up nest boxes. And so to attract these guys, they also love, they love peanuts. I didn't put it on there, but sunflower, suet, mealworms, and peanuts. And they will take an entire, a whole peanut. They have a big enough beak, unlike the chickadee, to grab a whole peanut and take off with it. It's pretty cool. Sweet little birds. White-breasted and red-breasted nuthatches. Um, so they are so beautiful and they actually look very, very different. Their behaviors are similar. Um, and if you know nuthatches, both species have a very nasally call. You know, it's um, the red-breasted nuthatch, it's like beep, 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 beep. To me, it sounds like a little bird highway. It's kind of a nasally beeping. Um, the bird that you, the nuthatch that you would see most commonly on Cape Cod is um, the white-breasted. And that's because they pretty much, you can find them in any habitat, forests, woodlots, groves, edges, parks, suburbs, um, any place there's tree, trees present. However, the red-breasted prefers uh, conifer trees and they like mature forests. So here I have um, a lot of conifer trees. It's actually a very mixed forest. And so I have both species, uh, which is wonderful. There was an abundance of red-breasted nuthatches this year, this winter, everyone was noting this. Um, and so I assume it's all, it was also visitors from the North um, who were visiting my feeders this winter. So what do they love to eat? They absolutely adore sunflower, peanuts, suet, and mealworms. And these guys, um, you can see here, they have the ability to climb on trees and climb um, face down. And um, they're able to cling to anything. So they will hang on a suet cage. They'll go to tube feeders, platform feeders, window feeders, you name it. Um, and they're not that shy. In fact, the red-breasted nuthatch, as tiny as it is, it's probably the easiest bird that you could get to eat out of your hand. And I'm not encouraging that, um, but just saying that they're very, very approachable and they get very accustomed to people. So um, insects and seeds are what they eat in the wild. And what we can give them is sunflower, peanuts, suet, and mealworms. And I know this is a ton of information and Rebecca is going to also put it on our YouTube page after. 
after this. So you can always look back or you can always email me with questions. Um, so woodpeckers. So on Cape Cod, we have four common species. We have a few more species, but these are the ones you can expect to get in your backyard. And I didn't include um, one of them, <clears throat> excuse me, which is the hairy woodpecker um, because they look very, very similar to the downy woodpecker. This is a northern flicker. This is a downy woodpecker. This is a red-bellied woodpecker. What they all have in common is they are all cavity nesters. And these guys can actually excavate their own cavities. You know, they have the bill to be able to do that. However, cavities are scarce. So they also benefit by you putting up boxes. Um, all of these birds, they're a little bit different. So the downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker, they love suet, peanuts, sunflower, um, they love mealworms. They will eat from a suet cage, a tube feeder, a window feeder, a platform. They're not fussy. Red-bellied woodpecker, um, I find them to be a little bit sh more shy. They love the suet cage. And I actually get them eating out of my window feeder because they can hang on it in a quick escape. Um, but I don't get them, you know, sitting in the platform feeder the way that a downy woodpecker does, if that makes sense. So they're more, more grab and go. They're not hanging around. The northern flicker, fascinating bird. You know, they're not typically a bird feeder bird, but they love suet. And so you can attract them with a suet cage. Um, I have flickers every day. They're definitely shy. When they see me in the door, they're the first to fly away. Um, but they love the suet and I even catch them with their long tongues uh, crawling around on my deck, licking up suet from between the cracks in the deck. It, cr it makes me laugh <laughs> um, because flickers, they're, they're different than other woodpeckers in that they're not your typical creeping woodpecker. You know, when you think of a downy woodpecker, you see them on trees, they're spiraling up, they're hugging the tree, they're creeping. Um, flickers, they love to forage on the ground because their number one food source is ants. Um, and so, of course, ants are not as available right now um, until the weather gets warmer, um, but they're, they love to forage on the ground in, oops, sorry, in ant hills. Um, and so that's why, you know, you can get these guys on platform feeders and they're like licking the stuff up with their giant tongue. It's kind of fun to see. They'll also eat uh, from orange slices and will eat mealworms, uh, sunflower, peanuts. It's pretty cool. Um, so these guys, they are absolutely abundant on Cape Cod and you can get them to your backyard, even if you're, you know, um, if you're living in a, a flat on the second floor, um, I feel like you can get them by using, putting out sunflower, especially in suet. They're so sweet. The American Robin, also not a typical backyard uh, bird feeder bird. Um, they do not eat from bird feeders readily. Um, interestingly, you can get them to come to platform type feeders. So at my house, I have the chopped peanut suet with hulled sunflower and I put out dried mealworms. I provide this in a tray, um, you know, a platform tray. And I also provide it in a bowl. And these birds are here, these robins are here every day eating this stuff. What you're not going to see is them perched on a bird feeder you know, eating out of it. They're just not, they're a heavier bodied bird than a lot of these birds. Um, and they're, you know, they're not gonna sit on a tube feeder and peck and in, peck into a little hole and pull seeds out. Um, but if you have a platform feeder, and I should specify what I mean by platform feeder, they sell um, platform feeders that are simply a dish that can be hung. I went to Agway and I bought one of those, um, saucers that go under your plants. It's plastic. So if it breaks, I don't have to worry. 
It sits on top of a small non-tip table on my deck. And that's my platform feeder. You know, it costs like 10 bucks. And the robins come, everyone eats out of it. The flicker sits in there licking everything. It's pretty good. They're very entertaining. So one way you can attract robins to your backyard is by planting fruit bearing trees. This is another bird that we have my migratory robins who just, they leave, they're gone south for the summer. But in the winter, we also have robins from the north who are coming here uh, to find food sources. And we consider them nomads. We also have some robins who stay and travel the countryside in search of food. And we call them nomads. And in the winter, there's no insects here. So what they're looking for is trees with persistent fruit um, that they can consume. So planting any of these of the native species uh, will uh, possibly attract robins to the backyard. Also, a lot of these plants they prefer to nest in. They like to nest in dense trees or shrubs, and they also like to nest on shelves. So this is a bird that if you have them in your backyard, you might actually get them nesting in your shed, you know, on a shelf. Um, something that they can prop their nest up on, which has cover. It looks like this bird, uh, I don't know if there was anything above this to protect those birds. It looks like a very precarious nest site, but you can see also that it serves, it's a shelf um, and the bird is able to, to build a nest tightly into it. For these ground feeding birds, it's really important. Uh, no pesticides, please. Organophosphates um, do poison woodpeckers uh, like flickers who are ground feeders and American robins um, and are really harmful for the environment. So what else can I tell you about robins? Just that at my house on the platform feeder, they're eating mealworms, chopped suet, and a little bit of hulled sunflower seed. And here's a bird that everyone wants um, to get in their backyard because they're so incredibly stunning. This is the Eastern Bluebird. They are also abundant on Cape Cod. For nesting, they really prefer open country, scattered trees, farms, roadsides, roadside perches um, that they can land on, and hawk insects. And what I mean by that is that they like to perch low, they see an insect, they flutter to the ground, they grab it, and then they go right back to that perch. That is the type of habitat that they need for breeding. They're also a cavity nesting bird, and so they greatly benefit by um, nest boxes being put up. Um, I do not have breeding habitat for bluebirds. I'm in the forest. But what's wonderful is in the winter, these guys become nomadic. They travel the countryside often with robins and waxwings looking for food. And just like the robins and waxwings, they are looking for persistent winter fruits. So all those fruit trees that I had recommended for robins and um, um, what was the other bird? Waxwings, um, these guys love that as well. Um, in the winter, they're also storm birds. If you have a heated bird bath, that is like a jacuzzi for them. That's the best way to get them to your backyard, entice them to your backyard with a heated bird bath. Um, and also they will eat from platform feeders. So dried mealworms, suet, pieces of suet, um, berries, either frozen berries that are thawed or fresh berries. This winter was my first winter. I finally got them on my deck on the second floor. It was the heated bird bath that did it. And I'm happy to say that they became so bold that they were even eating out of my window feeder. So you can imagine waking up in the morning and having two bluebirds over your sink in the morning. So if you don't have breeding habitat, don't despair because you might get them in the winter. And they often arrive with the bad weather. They're looking for opportunistic food sources. And if they like what they see, they'll be back <laughs> for sure. 
I had to add in here morning doves um, because I've given this presentation several times and a few people have pointed out, what about the morning doves? They're so lovely. We want morning doves. They are a beautiful, beautiful little bird. Um, they are the, the gentle giants. Uh, they're not the brightest bulbs on the bird planet. I can tell you that. Um, there's a tiny little brain in that little head because they build the flimsiest, flimsiest nests. Have you guys ever seen morning dove nests? I mean, it's literally like three sticks put together and then it's like, oh, here, and there's two eggs, you know, and it's sideways and eggs can just roll out. This nest is impressive. I almost wanna say that this bird built on top of someone else's nest because it's architecturally brilliant for a morning dove. Oops, but here is a morning dove um, sitting on a nest. This is a male. I know this because of the beautiful, see the rosy and purple iridescence, the blue cap, the beautiful blue eyeliner. Males and females incubate the young. They are phenomenal parents. And morning doves can actually have young all year long. And so do they have them all year long? Not necessarily because we have such seasonality here. It gets cold in the winter, but they have the ability to produce crop milk, which is basically um, a sloughing of the epithelial cells, the lining of the crop, which is the part of the esophagus. That forms this really protein fatty rich milk that they can regurgitate to their young um, and basically they have the ability to produce this year round as long as they have food sources available. Um, so they can nest near year round, but quite honestly, in our Northern states, they prefer to nest during the spring and summer months. And so um, they lay usually two eggs. You can find them in almost every habitat. They will be in open area, um, mixed woodland, orchards. They nest often in low uh, dense trees or shrubs and build these flimsy little nests. And they are not a bird that's going to perch on a tube feeder. They're too darn big and clumsy, but they love platform feeders. And what they'll eat is any kind of mixed seed, cracked corn, the millet, sunflower, hulled sunflower. They don't eat as much suet although I find they eat my suet crumbles. I'm sure it's very nutritious for them. They also don't typically eat the mealworms. These are seed eating birds. So any um, good quality mixed bird seed will do it for them. And they don't have the ability to crack shells. So they eat everything whole. Uh, they swallow all their seeds whole and then their gizzard, which is the grinding portion of their stomach, breaks it down for them. They're so cool. Probably you guys must all have morning doves. They mate for life. Yes, they're so, I think they're so, so pretty. Um, and morning doves, I just want to point out, they're another one. They love to nest near human dwellings. And so it wouldn't be uncommon for you to find one nesting, you know, in your shed out back on the ledge, just like a robin. And the young are gone pretty quickly. They fledge the, the nest around two weeks. And so we typically tell people, you know, if there's a nest in a, an undesirable place, if you can please just wait because the babies will be out of the nest often within two weeks. And then you can take the nest down and put something in its place to discourage them from nesting again. Um, it is illegal to remove bird nests of migratory birds once there are eggs or young in the nest. And so I like to remind people of that. And um, start looking now. Look for signs of nest building. And if you see birds building a nest in one of your potted plants and you don't want them to, now's the time to discourage them. And pieces of pool noodle you know, the cheap pool noodles that we can buy for the pools, there's styrofoam. Um, I don't like styrofoam, but 
Those are easy to cut up and to stuff into holes to prevent birds from nesting. Okay, so um, last but not least, the ruby-throated hummingbird. Everyone loves this bird. Who doesn't love a hummingbird? They're absolute, they're feathered jewels, migratory marvels. They will be arriving soon. So uh, get your feeders ready and your sugar water. They'll be back um, honestly anytime, but it's usually late April. And what you can give them is you can make a homemade sugar water mixture, which is basically boiling one part sugar, sugar to four parts water. You boil it, stir it, allow it to cool. I like to give my hummingbirds their uh, nectar in the feeder at room temperature. I don't just take it out of the fridge and give it to them ice cold um, because that would be detrimental to them. So what I do is every morning I take out a little bit of whatever um, I need and I just let it sit for even 30 minutes just to get the chill out before I put it into the feeder. Do not use red dye. It's unnecessary and it's also harmful um, to the birds. Almost every hummingbird feeder out there is red or has red on it and that will attract the birds to the feeder. So you don't need dye. These birds are attracted to tubular flowers and they really benefit from native species. Um, so Allegheny monkey flowers, bluebell of Scotland, milk, butterfly milkweed, cardinal flower. Um, these are examples that I pulled from the Audubon native plant database for my location. Um, native plants that are tubular, have tubular flowers that these birds love. Um, this is really important because you can see they have that sword-like bill and they plunge it into tubular shaped flowers to then extract the nectar. It's important for you to also know that these birds are not just drinking nectar, they're eating a ton of insects. When they're probing into flowers, there's all these little insects in there and they are eating them. They have very high protein needs and they have a high metabolism to fuel. The other thing that you should know is we all like to think that um, birds are just eating at our feeders. I get this question every year. Is it okay for me to put out jelly because my Oriole's picking out and all he eats is jelly? Well, I know that we think that, but really they are, birds are getting food um, and all the nutrition that they need from all around them. You know, they're eating wild seeds, they're eating insects. Our bird feeders really are just a supplement. Does it help them? Yes, it helps them, especially, you know, when they've just arrived from migration, uh, when we have periods of terrible weather and cold spells, it helps them when they have extra mouths to feed. And so I think that uh, bird feeders and feeding birds is incredibly beneficial. There's no harm to it. Um, and so I know you think that this hummingbird is just coming to your house, but he's really, really not. You're just one stop on the way but you wanna keep it fresh because he likes your stop. Um, the female tends to the young. The dad is a total deadbeat. After she lays the first egg, um, dad is gone and the female does everything. She broods the young, she feeds the young, and then she actually has to feed them for over a week after they leave the nest. Because if you can imagine, it takes some skill to figure out um, how to drink from flowers and how to eat insects on the wing. So this is probably the easiest bird to buy bird feeders for because everyone sells hummingbird feeders. There's all sorts of designs and shapes. Um, what I love is it's called a jewel box window feeder. It's literally, it looks like a little jewelry box, little square suction cups to my window. And I have these beautiful birds in my window all day throughout the summer drinking their nectar. Um, it's important to clean the feeders very frequently uh, because in the summer months when it's really hot out, especially that sugar water is gonna go rancid. It gets moldy, it gets oily. 
And so you want to use um, either boiling hot water, some people use vinegar, or you can use one part bleach to nine parts water. Just make sure you wash all of this out very well and dry it before you put your um, nectar into it. Hummingbirds you can get pretty much everywhere. You find them in wooded areas, open areas, you find them along the coast. They're incredibly and remarkably resilient. And so I feel confident in saying that wherever you are, you can get hummingbirds as long as you have an abundance of um, flowers around you to attract them and to provide them with nourishment. There's so much more I could say about hummingbirds, but, but I don't have enough time. <laughs> Maybe I'll do a hummingbird talk this year, Rebecca. Um, okay, so all these birds, I just told you how to attract all these birds, right? Well, when you attract all those birds, you also attract this guy. This is a Cooper's hawk, and we also, some people call them a, a sparrow hawk, although that's usually reserved for the kestrels, um, but they are a bird eating hawk. And so if you call me and say that there's been a hawk in your backyard, you know, preying on your bird feeder birds, it's probably a Cooper's hawk. And there isn't a lot you can do um, to discourage these birds, because this is what they do. So what you can do is make sure that you provide lots of cover. Um, so, you know, a brush, um, small trees, flowers, windbreaks, even um, a brush pile that birds can dive into in an instant to get away from predators. Because it's no fun going out every day and seeing piles of morning dove feathers under your feeder, you know, because Mr. Cooper's hawk's been out there having a buffet. And they are beautiful birds. It's unfortunately do that. Also, you need to know with all this food around, uh, you should expect the unexpected. You never know what's going to come to your bird feeders. And it will, you do have to consider that bird feeders could attract mice or rats. Um, and so you want to make sure that your feeding stations aren't um, so close to your house that you're going to attract um, small rodents. It also might attract turkeys, um, squirrels, sometimes snakes go into nest boxes. And I have to play you this video because this is, I know it's very grainy. It's because I took this video at night, um, but this is my window feeder. It's plastic and has wood on the sides and it suctions to the window. And I have, um, oops, probably the largest They become largely dormant in the winter, and then they, um, and then I start seeing them again. So right now I probably see at least fifteen a night. I, I have a lot of them. They're so wonderful. I apologize. I have the for some reason the slipperiest computer mouse ever. The, as soon as I touch it, it advances the slide. Um, so this is a southern flying squirrel. They are a non-native species. They are absolutely abundant on Cape Cod and most people don't know about them because they're nocturnal. Notice those giant eyes. They don't truly fly. They have um, flaps of skin here called a patagium and that allows them to glide. When you see it, it's brilliant. It's the appearance of flying, but it's not true flight like a bird. And so I love them as long as they don't decide to take up residence, you know, in my walls. Uh, I am thrilled that they're here. And I actually have two, three, three flying squirrel boxes on the property to encourage them, discourage them from, you know, nesting in my home um, and encourage them to utilize outdoor spaces. So far, knock on wood, so far, so good. Okay. So now I have um, a few simple ways that you can all coexist with and attract your native birds. Um, I have a few slides to represent these bullet points, but I'm going to go through this first. This is an American robin. This is a, a dad. Um, mom and dad feed the young. They're great, great parents. 
So don't remove trees or brush piles during the spring or summer months. Uh, we recommend that people keep dead trees. And if you have to do tree felling or tree pruning, please reserve tree felling for the late fall and winter months. You know, if you start tree felling next month, you're going to be displacing baby squirrels and baby birds. So if it can wait, please do. Um, place your feeders um, within 15 feet from windows. Although this is a tough one because you don't want to attract rodents um, close to your home either. But by placing feeders closer to your windows, um, there's less, less likelihood if a bird strikes the window that they will really, really hurt themselves because they can't get up enough momentum to cause a huge impact, if that makes sense. Um, I'm just going to skip down because I have slides for a few of these. Check your grills, boats, dormant vehicles. I'm telling people to do this now. Um, check your grills. Make sure there's no mouse nests in them. If there is a mouse nest in them, um, you can get mom to move the babies by putting a box inside of the grill. Um, mom will sense the changes and she will very likely either move her babies entirely or move them into the box at which then you can just move the entire family out of the grill. Um, we don't have, I don't have enough time unfortunately to go into all the details, but if you call Wild Care, we'll give you tips on how to encourage animals to relocate their babies. And this, um, this goes for not birds, but small mammals. Birds can't relocate their babies um, because most songbirds are born, you know, they, they're hatched blind, naked, and helpless. Mom can't move them. But animals like mice and squirrels, um, you can encourage them to relocate their babies. So let's go through these. So save a tree, save an owl. Trees are never really dead. Um, we so desperately need cavities for nesting birds, uh, cavity nesting birds. And so keep up your old snags. I know they might be unsightly, but they're probably crawling with life and might actually have animals that use them as nesting or roosting sites. I apologize for this gruesome uh, image. Um, keep your cats indoors. Uh, cats are responsible for the death of over 2.4 billion birds annually in the United States, and that is believed to actually be a gross underestimate. And that number, as alarming as it is, that only represents birds in the U.S. and does not even account for the, the small mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and beneficial insects that are killed by cats. Um, it's far more uh, safe to keep your cat indoor and it's safer for the wildlife as well. So I always tell people, if your cat absolutely needs to experience the great outdoors, you can buy your cat a catio. Have you guys heard of this? It is basically a patio for your cat so they can go in and out and they think they're outside, uh, but they're actually contained. It's brilliant and you can now build or buy these for less than $300. Saves a lot of lives. Um, reduce window strikes. One easy thing that we can all do to help reduce window strikes is um, to keep unnecessary lighting outside of your home, keep it off. What happens is when birds are migrating, like this northern perula who passes through here in, in May, they pass through here in big numbers. Um, when they see a lot of light pollution, they often mistake it for celestial cues, which they use to migrate. It becomes disorienting, and then they will circle those lights to the point of exhaustion, or they strike um, the building that those lights are coming from. And so simple things we can do is uh, to try to reduce our light pollution, and especially during the spring and fall months when birds are passing through, birds are migrating. There's so many things you can do. You can keep your windows dirty. And then when your friends come over and say, my God, you know, don't you wash your windows? And you can say, oh, it's, I keep them dirty for the birds. 
<laughs> um, so you can be lazy and blame it on the birds, okay? UV decals, they really, really work. Um, these are uh, decals that you put on your window that you can barely see, but birds see them because they have UV particles embedded into them. What's happening is uh, birds do not recognize a reflection in a window as a as um, a structure, if that makes sense. All they see is what's being reflected. So if you have a nice shiny window and it's reflecting the forest, they think they're flying into that forest. And so what we need to do is break up that reflection. There's so many, I could give a whole talk on this because there's so many ways to do it. I'm happy to report that this Northern Perula um, looking pretty terrible right here, made a complete recovery um, and was released the next day. I have a beautiful release video of this gorgeous bird. And when you think about the distances they travel, some of these neotropical songbirds, you know, traveling from South America through here only to strike a window, it truly breaks my heart. And so really happy to see this long distant migrant get back on its way. Uh, please say no to rodenticides and glue traps. Uh, rodenticides are so harmful. They poison the un unintended um, by basically causing secondary poisoning. So rodenticides are anticoagulant poisons. They cause, um, basically they inhibit the blood's ability to clot, causing um, anything that ingests it to bleed out internally. And so if you poison a mouse, it goes outside, it's looking for water, it's debilitated, it's bleeding, and then Mr. Redtail Hawk comes along and finds an easy meal. Well, guess what? Mr. Redtail Hawk is now poisoned by that rodenticide. Um, and so we are vehemently opposed to rodenticides. Um, there's so many more uh, humane things you can do to control or deter rodents. Rodenticides is not one of them. So these birds, um, this hawk and this owl, they all recovered, thank goodness in our care and they were released. This is a screech owl on a glue plate. I absolutely hate glue plates. I think they should be outlawed. Um, they trap the unintended. This bird probably saw insects wiggling around on the glue, flies in and gets hopelessly entangled in glue. I also think it's a really inhumane way to kill rodents. Um, the animals that come to us stuck on glue plates often have fractures, skin tears, and feather loss from struggling. So I don't want to be a downer. I just want to tell you the reality of um, these are harmful products. It's honestly far more humane to snap trap or electric trap rodents than to utilize these products. Um, lead. This, this uh, does pertain to songbirds because there's more lead in the environment than we know. But um, the number one killer of loons, for example, in the Northeast has been found to be lead poisoning. And that's because these birds in particular are ingesting lead sinkers, lead uh, fishing jigs, lead tackle, lead shot. And that's not what the talk is about today. However, you know, when I did more research, there's so much lead in the environment and studies are actually showing that songbirds actually contain often harbor high levels of lead and mercury um, in their blood. And so eliminating, you know, something as simple as um, eliminating your lead tackle from your tackle box, definitely helpful to the environment, the watershed, and to many different species. We already talked about um, nest boxes. Um, buy it or build it and they will come. You can't go wrong with nest boxes. Someone will use it. It might not be the species you were hoping for, um, but someone will use it for sure. And so again, you can purchase bird nest boxes at Bird Watchers General Store, Brewster's Birdhouse, Snows, Wild Birds Unlimited in Yarmouth, Mass Audubon. And then you can utilize that Cornell Nest Watch page to look up your location or region and find out what kind of birds you can attract in your area. My last slides are 
I think in my description, I promised to tell you what to do if you find a baby bird and what to do if a bird strikes your window. And so I first want to say that uh, Wild Care, we have a baby bird program and we take in baby birds. We do a lot of phone mitigation and prevention. We try to prevent birds from being kidnapped unnecessarily. Not all baby birds are orphans, and I'll explain. And despite our phone prevention, we still received 523 songbirds last year. Most of those were orphans. And the only way we can do this is because we have over 40 volunteers dedicated to coming in once a week for a three hour shift and feeding those babies for us. It's a lot of hungry mouths and a lot of cleaning. It's also a really fun volunteer position. And I believe we have a few spaces left if anyone is interested. It does require um, a summer or six month commitment, three hours once a week. And you come in and all you do is feed the babies. The volunteers tell me it's the most rewarding thing they've ever done in their life. Um, and so what happens is people call us because they've found baby birds. And so you might find a baby bird and you can call us and we will ask you a bunch of questions. And by the way, these are American Robins and the little one was an Eastern Phoebe. Um, sometimes there's a lot to be said for to have friends, even if they're not the same species. Um, this little bird was not eating, but because of the behavior of these larger birds begging, it stimulated this bird to beg. And certainly at this age, when they're all still blind, they're just opening their eyes, it doesn't matter um, that we've mixed species. So we do do that with some species. So if you find a baby bird on the ground, we're gonna ask you a bunch of questions. Is it naked? Was it in a cat's mouth? Is, did the nest fall down? Do you know where the nest came from? Did you give it food or water? Is it naked, blind, and helpless? Does it look like this, an alien? Because if you find this bird on the ground, unless you know exactly where the nest is, um, we're probably going to have you warm it up and bring it to us. Because this bird cannot survive. We can't take the risk of you you know, putting it into the nest, um, putting it into a basket and waiting for the parents to come because the bird can't thermoregulate. So if it's naked, blind and helpless, we're probably gonna have you bring it to us unless you know exactly where the nest is and you can get it back and then the parents take care of it. Um, these are nestlings. This is all American Robin. These guys are a little older. They can hold up their head. They're starting to get feathers. They're starting to thermoregulate. If you find them on the ground, um, we will do the same. If you find them on the ground and you think you know where the nest was, we might have you put the nest into a basket and hang it in the tree and watch for the parents. But again, we don't have a ton of time because they can't um, thermoregulate well and they need to be fed. But sometimes it works. Sometimes people know exactly where um, that nest was and they put it back with a basket and the mom hears the babies and she comes and feeds them. So it's worth the effort. Here's the guy that causes us the most trouble. This is the most kidnapped baby bird age. Um, this is the juvenile delinquent teenager Robin, um, which we also call a fledgling. So this bird, he would have left the nest. He's huge, the size of a parent, fully feathered, um, but he can't fly yet. And so people would see this bird on the ground and say, oh my God, there's a baby and you know, it can't fly, I need to take it to you. Well, most songbirds, they leave the nest days before they can actually fly. And so what we're gonna do is have you watch for the parents. If you see the parent birds around feeding it, that is awesome. That's the best case normal scenario. Um, if it's been in the cat's mouth, any of these birds, if they've been in a cat's mouth, it's gonna need to be brought to us because cats have um, a lot of different bacteria in their mouth. One of them is pastorella and that can be really harmful to birds. So um, I was kind of rushing through this, but in the case of 
all the unfeathered babies, we would ask you to keep them warm. Don't give them food or water. Um, keep them quiet. You know, don't um, don't play with them. Take selfies. Let your dog sniff them and all those things, um, because we will have frightened, frightened babies. So this bird, as long as the parents are taking care of it and it doesn't appear to be injured, you can leave it there. If you must, must, must do something because this bird can't fly yet and you're still worried about it, you can put it into a low shrub um, out of immediate harm's way and watch for the parents. It's an old wives tale that if you touch a bird, um, the parents will abandon it. Uh, birds do not, most birds do not have an amazing sense of smell. Some of them do. The songbirds do not, but also the fidelity to the young is so strong um, that we could put a baby robin into a robin's nest, a baby that doesn't even belong to it, and those parents will feed it. What they see is hungry mouths begging, and they are genetically programmed to feed and provide the best care possible for those young. So don't worry about your scent. Um, they are not even going to notice. Oops. And my last thing is if a songbird strikes your window. So this was a hermit thrush who was migrating through, struck a window um, and was brought to wild care. If a bird strikes a window, please don't leave them on the deck just laying there because they're going to be picked off by the neighbor's cat, a dog, a cooper's hawk. Um, put the bird in a box, bring it inside cool, dark place, one to two hours, no peeking. In two hours, bring the bird outside near a shrub or a place where it can dive in for escape. Um, open the box. Usually it will be a few brief seconds and the bird will look around and then take off. If they don't take off, if they seem dazed or if their eyes are closed, if there's any blood or fluid around the mouth, eyes, any obvious injuries, that's when they need to come into us. More often than not, um, birds are mildly stunned um, and they are fine. They just need to get their whereabouts. Um, but if they don't fly off within two hours, that's usually they have some sort of um, trauma, brain trauma, and they can come in and be treated. And some rehabbers think differently. They feel that every bird should be brought in no matter what because birds might fly off and then there's brain swelling. Um, but we just feel that the stress of bringing them in, rehabbing them for several days um, is, um, is not entirely necessary. It might be more stress than we feel is good, if that makes sense. So if they're bright and alert and they can fly off after two hours, we are grateful and we hope we wish them well on their way. So I hope that you guys um, learned a lot in this presentation. I hope it wasn't overwhelming. And I hope you also learned that by your simple actions, you can make a hugely positive difference for wildlife, even just the wildlife in your backyard. It's, it's entire communities of wildlife in your backyard um, that you are assisting. And as Rebecca already mentioned, you guys were amazing. We're almost up to $500 in donations from this talk. That is incredible. And I just want to say thank you. Yes, thank you. And now I have <laughs> questions. <laughs> yes. Um, and we have volunteer opportunities and baby bird opportunities if you're interested. And now I am ready for questions. Um, so let's see, we're going to backtrack a little bit back to food and um, will orange flavored suet benefit the Orioles? Um, Jackie is looking for some alternatives to jelly since she had a real issue with yellow jackets last year. Oh, yes. Yeah. And yellow jackets are a problem for me. The yellow jackets were a problem late way later in the season, not the whole season. But I totally understand it becomes unbearable to go outside. Um, yes, the Orioles love the orange suet. They would love that. And you can also put, um, you can put the jelly and oranges farther away from the house. I know it's not quite as fun because then you can't watch the birds as closely. 
Um, but yes, I use orange suet also and they love it. Um, let's see, woodpecker question. Um, we've got several, we think yellow bellied sapsuckers trying to make nest cavities in our cedar siding. We keep scaring them away, including installing flashers where they're pecking to no avail. Will they naturally stop after in the nesting season? And if so, when would that be? Okay, so um, so are they are they actually making holes or are they drumming? Is what I want to know. Um, if they're because woodpeckers first engage in a in a territorial drumming, where males are announcing their territory and they're trying to attract females, and thank God that doesn't generally cause any harm to the the side of the house or the roof. Um, but if they're making actual holes because they're excavating. One thing that works, and this is going to sound ridiculous, um, those motion detected spiders that you can buy for Halloween, you can buy them on Amazon, they detect motion and then they drop. Those are brilliant. Those mm -hmm. work um, and birds won't become, it's not something they become habituated to, you know, like putting out a plastic owl, for example. Uh, so you could try that um, or you, if you're a handyman, you know, putting different types of flashing and stuff on the location um, so that they can't actually excavate. Or you could put a bird, a nest box up in that location and pray to God that they use the nest box instead of drilling on your house. That sometimes works. Then they have, they have a real place to move into. Um, that actually answered a couple of questions. Wayne, I hope you were listening to that because that answered your question as well. Um, I do have neighbors are using herbicides on their lawns lately. Does this harm the birds, especially our robins looking for worms? Yes, herbicides are a huge problem, especially any um, organophosphate, organophosphates. Um, and the... I can never pronounce it, but neonicotinoids can never pronounce that word. Um, so yes, this is causing problems and also killing bees. And there are so many, if they would just Google, you know, organic product, uh, safe products for the backyard, there are so many resources. For example, for to get rid of ants in the backyard, you can use a food grade diatomaceous earth and a vinegar spray, vinegar and water and spray it on the parameters um, of your home or wherever else the ants are getting into. And that's a simple way. The vinegar is not going to harm um, the flickers and the other birds that are foraging. So if you can encourage your neighbors to, <laughs> to Google organic and safe alternatives. We do have some information on our website, but we are incidentally going to be offering a talk on this in a couple of weeks. So be watching for that invitation um, and invite your neighbor. Yes, and I wish I, goodness, I wish I had, um, I don't have, it depends on what kind of herbicides they're spraying and what they're trying to get rid of. And then I could recommend some products. Um, so we've had a couple of people ask this and I am very comfortable answering this. We all of our platform feeders and yes, your squirrels will absolutely decimate everything on that platform feeder and no, there is not really anything you can do about it except just enjoy the fun and refill it. Squirrels are tough. Baffles, baffles are probably your best friend. Um, squirrels, as you know, they're incredibly athletic and they do figure things out. I do not recommend, do not put sticky tape or um, put grease on your poles because you are going to end up, that's going to harm the birds. Um, so I would say baffles, cut away any tree limbs that allow easy access for the squirrels to, you know, kamikaze down onto the bird feeders. Um, if bird feeders are too close to your house, they could launch off of the roof, you know, so just thinking they are great at obstacle courses. So you just need to think like a squirrel and Mike O'Connor at Birdwatchers General Store, he's got 
everything. He's got the, the bird feeder that swings the squirrels around and supposedly doesn't hurt them. Um, he can definitely make recommendations also. Okay. I gave up. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just gonna do one more thing because um, a lot of people are saying thank you and that they really enjoyed this. Um, Good. But peanuts. So can you buy bags of peanuts and feed them? They're usually full of chemicals. Are organic peanuts okay? Yes, organic peanuts are fine. Or you can feed the shelled peanuts um, that you can buy like at the bird watchers store. Um, I will tell you if you buy, if you put out peanuts in the shell, you'll find them in your yard for years to come <laughs> because the squirrels bury them everywhere, included, including your potted plants. So if you don't want to find shells everywhere for the next 10 years, you might want to buy just the hulled uh, peanuts, which are raw, organic, um, healthy, healthier for them, and um, less of a mess, and less of an attraction for unwanted rodents. So I think that does it for us. We're sort of at our time that we promised for this one. Please, please, please be on the lookout for our future talks. I hope that you enjoyed this. I certainly did. I learned a couple of things and I'm on a lot of these talks with Stephanie. So it's always <laughs> fun to learn something new. Um, and again, if you would like to make a donation, you can log on to our Facebook and donate there. There's a big fat donate now button. It's blue, I believe. Um, we have a similar button on our website wildcarecapecod.org. You can email me if you have any trouble doing any of that. And you can also email me if you would prefer to give us your hours instead of your dollars. Um, I'm happy to share any volunteer opportunities for 2021 and into 2022 with you um, as things hopefully continue to move forward and everyone is healthy and safe and things can start to reopen. Um, so we'll be sharing those opportunities with you over the course of this year, but please be watching your emails and be watching our social media for the rest of our Wild Wednesday offerings. And I wanna thank Stephanie, thank you so much for your time. This was awesome. Hey, you're you welcome. Got a lot out of it. And there are a few links on our website for people that are looking for um, decals for your windows um, and how to prevent some um, inter negative interaction with wildlife. So you can find that under some of our past events. Um, and if you poke around, there's some pretty good information in there. But again, if you need anything, you can always email me or you can email Stephanie. We are always, always, always here to help. So thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll see you next week and the week after. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Oh, I see a cat made an appearance. Bye. <laughs>